Good to go. Okay, perfect. Okay. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is David Schutz, also known as Darth Null. You can follow me on Twitter there if you like. Sometimes I say interesting things. And I like crypto puzzles. I, I like crypto puzzles a lot. I've competed in about 20 contests since 2009, uh, about a half dozen other puzzles that I've sort of played on the side that were uh, like previews of other of puzzles for different cons, things like that. Um, typically, I've, I've liked what, uh, what I'll call classic attacks, uh, classic challenges, old-fashioned ciphers, uh, puzzles that require, require brain teasers or intuitive leaps. A lot of these things you can solve with pen and paper, not really big on advanced uh, ciphers like AES, PKI. Uh, as it turns out, I'm often the first person to solve these things. Uh, and a lot of times I, I solve them pretty quickly. So what's my secret? This is a structured approach. This is a good way to attack a puzzle or just a problem in general. You start at the top, you kind of think of ideas that are related to it. You carefully ex examine those ideas, move forward. When you have problems, you back up, you go to the next idea might describe this as a disciplined approach. This is kind of how I attack problems. And it's not very efficient. So if I were a coder, and I'm actually a programmer by education, though not really by trade, you might try to express this in programmatic terms. Ideally, if you have an idea, you want to think about the idea, does it make sense? Is it something that, that really is a good idea or not? If it's not a good idea, but it leads you to think of something, well, let's look at that other something. If it is a good idea, then attack it. Go out at full, full bore, play with it, see if you can come up with any results, and if that then leads you to new ideas, obviously explore those. If the idea is no good at all, throw it away. That's an ideal algorithm. This is a bad way to do it. You have an idea, you go with it. You say, oh, I'm going to solve this, I'm going to play with it, I'm going to keep trying. Eh, that didn't work, I can keep trying again. Oh wait, that gave me something else, I'll play with that some more. You end up wasting a lot of time this way. For one thing, if it was a bad idea to begin with that inspired other bad ideas, then now you've doubled your pain. If I had to use a single word to describe this approach, it might be squirrel. <laughs> so what a lot of this comes down to when you're doing a puzzle or when you're doing security testing, which is what I'm gonna try and relate all this to, is a lot of it is about your enthusiasm outpacing common sense. It's great to have enthusiasm. It's great to come up with these ideas, but you've got to test the ideas. You have to think about them, evaluate them, run with them carefully. In, in short, you need common sense. You also need not so common sense, and that's really what's coming with experience. So is this just about games? It's not just about games. To, a, to an extent, I think that solving some of these puzzles are, are like a gateway drug for other kinds of security testing. A lot of the skills that you apply in these kinds of things, the structured approach, identifying patterns in your target, uh, recognizing the techniques that are being used, the algorithms that you need to solve a puzzle, and especially being able to make intuitive jumps that make sense. All those skills are very useful for application testing on, on devices or, or web apps or such. Uh, penetration testing, reverse engineering, all those are good skills for all these other things. So what I hope today to do is to describe some things that I've done in the past, problems I've had, and how I can apply those to security mm -hmm. testing. So I'll pick a skill or a pitfall that I've run through, trying to illustrate it with some of the boneheaded mistakes I've made, and apply that, and then repeat. So, first lesson that we should all learn, keep it simple. Back on ThoughtCon, uh, ThoughtCon 1 was 2010, I was actually on travel, so I'm sitting in a hotel room and I read my Twitter feed and I say, oh, there's a puzzle, excellent. So I'll start, start playing this and after several steps I came to where I found a web page filled with several images and other clues led me to believe that there was a text hidden in that image of this little screaming castle tea-like thing. Uh, once you manage to extract the data, you have this long string of hex data. Uh, I honestly can't remember if it was binary data or if it was an ASCII string of all the actual hex. I think it was just an ASCII string of the hex. <laughs> anyway, what do you do with that? So my first thought was, well, lots of E's and F's and 1's. So there's lots of uh, running strings of 1's and 0's and 1's, 1's and 0's. And so maybe it's Morse code, but it didn't really look right. There, there wasn't enough consistency to try and turn that into dots and dashes. Maybe it's a picture. I 
kind of went down that path for a long time. I said, okay, well, let's, um, I was actually working on Backtrack. I'd had a laptop with no hard drive because the, the work I was doing required me not to take data out of the, this particular customer. They're kind of weird that way. So I'm sitting in my hotel room, I'm booting off Backtrack, and I'm like, okay, what do I do now? Well, I'll just work in terminal. I like working in terminal. I'm kind of an old Unix dumb terminal geek. So I wrote a program that just took those uh, things, spat them out as stars or spaces, depending on whether it's a one or a zero, or I would flip it. And then I'd kind of resize the window to change the resolution. I squint at it and say, oh, it looks like an L there. No, that's not right. I spent a couple hours at night playing with this, said, this is stupid, went to bed. And yes, it was stupid, because that was entirely the wrong way to solve this problem. The right answer was just a simple XOR. The key that you used to extract the image from the steganography was the same key you needed to get data out of this, uh, to get plain text out of this data. So you took the EF, the first byte was EF, exclusive or that with DE, you get a one, a ASCII one. And the next one you get an ASCII one, you get a space. So what you end up with is just this long series of ones and zeros and ones. In this case, you see there's one one in a space and an O one in a space, and after a few more characters, a big space, and like two or three spaces, I think it was, then again. So it's almost like you can see word breaks there turn those into dots and dashes and you get mail dash s and it was a subject line and an email address and stuff and that was how you won the puzzle. So the lesson we should learn here was not to waste time on the unlikely because there are infinitely many ridiculously outlander schemes out there. You can think of the craziest thing possible and it might make perfect sense to you like oh of course they did it this way but most often it's not. Um, but you do need to remember some of these crazy ideas for later, some of the less crazy. Like actually, I did see for a CTF qualification a couple years ago where they did have a binary image that you had to resize and, and get data out of. And they actually made that crazier because you could resize it to one dimension and get one image, resize it to another dimension and get a different text. So sometimes these are, are handy. Lesson two was don't overestimate your targets. Uh, Carolina Con 2011, uh, I didn't actually go to this con, but GMARC was kind enough to let me play the puzzle beforehand. Uh, it gave you 256 uppercase letters, and you can see the puzzle there had a kind of a Civil War theme. So I knew from a puzzle that I had solved, not a puzzle, uh, there had been a uh, scrap of ciphertext that was discovered in a museum in Richmond a few months beforehand, and GMARC had sent it to me and said, hey, you should have fun with this. So I managed to, to break that. So from my research in breaking that, I knew that a uh, Visionnaire cipher was a very likely candidate for Civil War cipher. So that's probably what GMARC did here. Um, the Confederacy used primarily three different keys for all their crypto, which is crazy. Uh, and so I tried the first key, which was the one that was on the, the uh, historical document I'd seen before, Manchester Bluff. Hey, look, it decodes, but it only decodes the first 86 characters. The rest was still encrypted. I tried all kinds of other things. I tried other keys. I tried transposition ciphers. I tried brute force type attacks, nothing. And another question that I had was, was this the sort of thing where I take the, the first ciphertext and apply it to the entire, or the first key and apply it to the entire text, and I get some plain text and then some other stuff? Do I take the other stuff as it was decoded, quote unquote, and then use that? Or do I take the other stuff before it was decoded and use that? So all kinds of questions. How far down did GMARC take this? How difficult did he make it? So again, this was a few weeks before the con. I was just kind of playing with it in my spare time, and I wasn't making any progress, and so he sent me a note, and I kind of tried to prod me along. So I, I started looking at the other two historical keys with the original ciphertext. So I've got the decoded block, then I took the next block after that, and I tried applying complete victory to it, and it didn't work. So I kind of dragged the key back and forth. I moved the C to the N, then I moved the CO to the N, and eventually when I got to the string Tory complete Vic, it decrypted the next 96 characters. Again, not the whole thing. Well, okay, now I've obviously got three things, so I'll take the last key, come retribution, did the same thing, found the right offset, that decrypted. Turns out I was being much too complicated. Much simpler answer, just use each key on the whole ciphertext in turn. Throw the first key at the ciphertext, you get the first block. Throw the second key at the entire ciphertext, and you get the next block. The reason it was rotated the way I was doing it was because I was kind of offset because of the way the different blocks of strings came out. Again, I was going, giving too much credit to the way the cipher had been produced. I was expecting it to be more complicated. It was just simpler than I expected. Real world example, uh, we were looking at a mobile application, and this application would authenticate to a remote server 
using the phone number and a particular uh, hardware-based ID, a, a serial number or a UDID was something like that. I'm not going to go into too much detail because obviously this was for a customer. Once you connected, you could list the items for sale on this particular uh, vendor. You could purchase things, you could download them, etc. So we're wondering, can we get stuff for free? So we wrote a Python script that would kind of uh, mimic everything, send off packets, replay things, etc. But we knew it would be difficult to do in real life because you'd still have to get this hardware-based ID off of whoever you're trying to you know, get to, to buy your stuff for you. Turns out we didn't need that thing. If you sent it without the device ID, it worked just fine. All you needed was the phone number of whoever you wanted to charge this thing to. So if you wanted to buy something from this vendor and charge it to the Underhills, you could do that. So what did we learn? Again, the, the, the lesson here is don't overestimate what your target is doing. Don't assume that they've fixed the obvious flaws. Don't assume that they've taken the most technically correct approach to the problem. Because sometimes they will, a lot of times they won't. All right. We also need to consider the implications of what you're thinking of. When you have an idea, not just evaluate and you know how you're evaluating whether or not it's good or bad, you have to think about what things your idea imply. Verizon has their data breach investigations report. They put it out every year. It's been put out for, this, this last year was the eighth year they've, they've sent it out. And for the last four years, they've had a puzzle. And I kind of skipped the first year. I got beat badly by the second, skipped the third year. And this year I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this one to win. And I just ran nonstop for like a whole weekend. Like many other puzzles, there are multiple stages in it. Early on in the puzzle, you got a big block of base 64 text. You kind of decoded that to a long poem. That was a complete red herring. Later on, you got directed via Pinterest to a site called, uh, I think it was I Have ASCII or I Love ASCII or something like that. It was filled with ASCII art. And one thing was, was this image. It used to have a little bow on top as well, but I cut that off. So I look at that and I think, oh, I know exactly what that is. That's another base 64 string. And if you remove all the stars that were in there, because they're not valid base 64, you can base 64 decode the result and you get a big block of completely random binary data. Fantastic. This is probably the ciphertext. The last pr prior two years, they had done something very similar where you got a base 64 code, decrypted it, it was binary, and then you used uh, OpenSSL to, to try and decrypt it. This, this has got to be it, right? Wrong. It was not. Because if you look back at this, you probably can't see very well, there's something about that that I didn't notice when I made the assumption that it was base 64. And sometime later, I created a tool that, would, had I had this at the time, would have made it blindingly obvious. There were no uppercase letters in this code. Base64 is uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and two other characters. I think it's a slash and a plus. I can't remember exactly. The chances of a random binary ciphertext encoding in Base64 with no uppercase letters has got to be zero. It's not zero. It's real damn close to zero. If I had seen this, I would have said, this is not it, and I wouldn't have wasted any time with it. As it was, I assumed it was the binary ciphertext, threw keys at it, etc. So I probably lost a little bit of time. Uh, but I don't think I ever found the right key while I had the wrong ciphertext, so it doesn't really matter too much. What this turned out to be was a grill cipher. 98% uh, of what was in there was absolute noise. The only thing that mattered in that entire block of text was the eights. Again, it was the eighth year they made the puzzle. If you were to print that out, cut a hole where every eight is, take the first base 64 text from early in the puzzle and lay the, the sheet with the holes on top of it, you could read characters, 32 characters through those holes. That was the final cipher text. Kind of a neat trick. So again, my lesson here is that you need, when you have an idea, to think of the implications. Think of what I thought of. What is my idea? What does it imply? What kinds of things are required by it? This is base 64. Okay, well, base 64 requires uppercase, lowercase, and numbers. It doesn't require them, but it, it should usually have that. And if I'm assuming that this is binary ciphertext, it's going to have all three. Does this have all three? No. Okay, I need to move on. For things like this, it's very helpful to have tools that can help you to analyze what you're looking at to help to verify the assumptions or refute what you're, what you're thinking. Another good one, try all the things. At B-Sides Phoenix, uh, again, I was lucky enough to be able to play this from, one from home. Uh, sitting at home, saw a tweet come through, a picture of a badge, hey, look, there's a puzzle. 
uh, the ciphertext was right there on the bat. If you look all the way around it, there's a string of, uh, of hex digits. It starts with, uh, what did I say, OE, 07, et cetera. So I assumed it was going to be an exclusive or puzzle. But what, what was the key? A nice thing about exclusive or puzzles is if you, the way that it works is if you take the cipher and exclusive or it with a key, you get a plain text. Conversely, if you take the, the cipher text and XOR it with a plain text, you'll start to get the key out. So you can recover the key by cribbing, they call it cribbing, known text against the cipher text. So if you know that it starts with www, you try cipher text, exclusive or www, and if you get an English looking word or something that makes sense, you've probably got the key and then you can build from there and decode the whole string. This, in, in this case, I said it was about 40 hex digits, so, it, so it's 20 pairs, so it's probably a URL. It's a very short string. So what did I do? I said, okay, this is, this is gonna be easy. I can do this. I cribbed triple W, I cribbed bit.ly, t.co, uh, besides Phoenix. The word snow was on the badge, so I tried that. Didn't get anywhere. So eventually I'm like, well, I gotta take a break. I made lunch. Sitting there at the lunch table with the kids, I got the computer on. And as I'm going through the, the website looking for ideas, I see a big crate stenciled with F Snow on the side. Because it was B-Sides Phoenix, and apparently they must have had a bad time at ShmooCon or something like that, because I guess they don't like snow. And of course, while I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, God, I hope the kids don't see this, because I don't want to have to explain what F Snow means to the kids. But anyway, it turns out that that was the key. There was snow on the badge. I didn't try F Snow. Why didn't I find the key? It's a very obvious, simple, plain English. The reason I didn't find the key is I didn't crib HTTP. I tried triple W, I tried bit.ly, I didn't start with HTTP. So the obvious lesson is be comprehensive. If you're gonna try something, try everything. Uh, and most importantly is if you're gonna try lots and lots of things, it helps immensely to have a good tool to, to repeat those things. So, if, so that if uh, subsequent tests are very, very light, very simple, don't have a big cost, try them all. Build up a big list of cribs or build up a big list of passwords or whatever try everything. Every time you find something new, you add it to the list. Next time you go through, you try those again. Let me expand on that, though, about tools. Make sure they're good tools. I mentioned the 2010 DBIR puzzle. Uh, again, it was an OpenSSL cipher, but we don't know which one. They just said it was OpenSSL. There's like 20 ciphers in, in OpenSSL, so which one is it going to be? So you write a script that takes your cipher text, picks a cipher, and throws the, the, the key you want to test against it. I'm pretty sure when I did that one, I was having some problems making the script work just right. So when I was doing the 2012 cipher, I made sure to have a known good test case so that when the script hit that, it worked, that spat out, yes, this is a good test. So I knew my, my tool worked properly. If you think your tool's working and it's not, you're gonna have problems. Uh, related to that is a is, uh, quick lesson for hashing. Remember that letter case matters. If you're gonna hash a hex string, uppercase hex string or lowercase hex string, they'll be different. Everybody knows this, or everybody that's worked with hashes should know this. I should know this. That still tripped me up, and I will explain it to you later. Circling back. Uh, Half Acre Brewing Company in Chicago put out a beer this past uh, spring, I think it was, called Cypher Beer. And I think it was Nicholas Prococo, uh, one of the ThoughtCon people, built a label for it that had a code in, encoded in it. And I never managed to get a hold of the beer, but I, somebody sent me a copy of the label. So I'm playing with this, and I'm looking at it, and there's all kinds of crazy things in there. There's little funny diagonal lines. There's, I looked at the path that the letters follow when you spell out words. Every H has a yellow background. All kinds of crazy things. What I ended up focusing on, though, was there's a couple of blocks there that you can see on the left and on the right that just have a whole bunch of rainbow sort of colors in them. Turns out there are eight blocks across, eight blocks down. Eight bits by eight eight bytes. Hey, that's terrific. But how do you read them? Because they, they also did some things to make it look visually interesting where the colors kind of alternate and stuff like that. So after some assumptions, I ended up with this hex string. The first eight bytes start with five and the last eight bytes start with four, which is interesting. They're all ASCII, but it's, the, the distribution seems wrong. So I started playing with that. Uh, I tried all kinds of things. I tried exclusive oring the left numbers against the right numbers, matching up colors. Instead of reading the, bit, the words across, I read sort of two by two blocks at a time. Nothing. Uh, set it aside for a while, and then, again, my nemesis, Gmark, suggested some ideas, and when he sent me the email, instead of writing the string out in hex, like I had been working on for so long, he just sent the disaster letters. And I looked at that, and I said, you know, I'm pretty sure I tried Caesar cipher against that text, but I'll try it again just to be sure. 
turns out, pork roll like cheese. It was the H was the Caesar shift. And you undid the H and you got the string out, and that was the correct answer. I know I tried it. I must have missed it. I didn't even have it in my notes. There was nothing that even said I had tried that, but I knew I must have. So if I had circled back to the beginning, I might have been able to find that. A uh, quick real-world example of remembering to go back to the beginning every now and then. The, uh, I've done a lot of work on how iOS mobile device management works, reverse engineering the protocol, understanding ins and outs. And when I was doing all that, I looked at it and found you have to set up a, a profile to send to the device to enroll it in the MDM service. And there's a little checkbox in there that said sign messages. And I said, okay, well, I have to figure out how this works. I'll check the box, enroll the device. Since I didn't know how it worked, my server didn't sign any data. Turns out the device didn't care. It worked just fine, even if I didn't sign anything. I thought that was weird, but I forgot about it. I just moved on. It wasn't really necessary to understanding what I wanted to know to learn, but I just moved on. So about eight months later, I was thinking about things, uh, other kinds of attacks you could do through MDM. And I was thinking it would be really interesting if a device, if you could forge responses from a device. So you could maybe have your, your BYOD, corporate managed phone, and have the MDM messages go to your server rather than to the phone. And the server would say, well, yes, I'm compliant. Well, yes, I don't have any bad applications on here, or I've got your password policy. And of course, by thinking of that, I tried to think of, of how you could prevent something like that from happening. And I thought, well, it would be really cool if the device could sign the messages back to the, oh, wait a minute. So here's what, how a, a device's response looks like when it talks to the server. It sends a, to an HTTP put over SSL, just sends a, a block of XML. It's called a, a property list file, a plist file. That's all it sends. Nothing in there. That's all I've been staring at was plists going back and forth between the server and the client. What I never looked at was the headers on the, the uh, HTTP connection. And right there in the top of the headers was this great big block, MDM signature. And that's an attached DER signature on that entire block back here. So this whole, whoop, this whole uh, string here signed by a key that's provided to the client when the client enrolls with MDM. So the server says, here's a private key, use it when you talk to me. And so if you check that block to, to sign messages, everything the client says back to the server would be signed. There's a good word to describe this, and that's derp. So the lesson here is to go back to the beginning every now and then. Uh, it's very easy to get lost in the weeds, to go way down that great big crazy attack tree that I showed earlier, and completely lose track of where you are. Uh, you need to, to kind of document the path, document what you're doing, document ideas that you've had back and forth. Every now and then, stop, regroup, look at what you've done, go back to the beginning. If you don't do that periodically, you're going to miss things. <clears throat> and what can you miss? It's, even with all this, it's very easy to miss the obvious. Back to the B-sides Phoenix, I'd mentioned that F Snow was the key. Turns out, it was right on the badge to begin with. Right there at 12 o'clock, I'd seen the word snow, but the hex string didn't have 40 characters. The hex string had 41 characters, and I wasn't sure whether you dropped off the first character or the last character. So I worked by cutting off the last character, which was the F, which was actually the first letter of the key. So right there on the, on the badge, that was the answer. Uh, also in the uh, DBIR puzzle, uh, again, they had a, a Pinterest site that you kind of went through for one of the stages, and most of the pictures didn't have any captions on it. This uh, bumper sticker from Big Lebowski had a caption, Market Dude, and Market Dude was the key, hidden right in plain sight. Real world example of not missing the obvious, I was working on a pen test, internal pen test on a large network, and we spent days scanning this network with NPAP. Uh, all kinds of things that slowed us down. Uh, once we were all done scanning, we kind of looked at what we had, <clears throat> and we parceled out you know, what we were going to do. A couple of folks went off of Core Impact, a couple of folks went off of Metasploit. And I noticed a, a machine that had open X window ports. And I said, okay, well, let's attach a key logger. Not five minutes after I attached the key logger, I watched an admin log into a router and change his password. And the irony of it, it was that it was actually a pretty strong password. It wouldn't have been something we could have cracked easily. That ID and password also gave a shell on a TACAC server where the credentials for all the TACAC users were in there. About half of them were crypt encoded. Short run with Jonathan Ripper, and we had a dozen admin accounts. All because I just said, oh, let's try X windows. What the hell? 
So sometimes X, in this case X window, really does mark the spot. Sometimes they're just really simple things, don't miss them, don't avoid the simple and the easy just because they're not glamorous or because they're not what you expect. Give them a try. Corollary to that though is don't miss the non-obvious. A lot of times there are subtle things that you might not catch right away. For example, this year CarolinaCon, uh, GMark had done had uh, done part of a puzzle at ThoughtCon, and they did part of a puzzle, did the whole puzzle at CarolinaCon. The first half, the Carolina was actually very similar to the ThoughtCon puzzle, so I, I blew through that quickly. The second part of GMark's puzzle at Carolina was all hex, which was very unusual for him. He, he likes just as I was saying the pencil and paper ciphers, the old old-fashioned stuff. So seeing something that was all in binary was very strange. To me. But I tried all the usual attacks. I tried cribbing with ex exclusive or I tried simple XORs just with a number or something like that, like 12. Um, I did notice a few interesting things. Almost every byte in the message had the high bit set. And there were only, for the first nibble, the first character of each, each hex pair, only 11 different values for that. There was no 0, 1, 2, 3, or B. And there was only, there were no C's or F's for the last character. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, it's a small cipher text. So it was probably a couple hundred characters. But it was still odd. I mean, it really told me that there wasn't a lot of entropy here. It was a strange cipher, whatever it was that he picked. So I'm thinking that doesn't make sense. I, I must have to do something else to this before I try to decode it. So I tried reformatting and looking at six bits at a time, base 64. I tried all kinds of crazy things. Didn't get anywhere. Finally, I just said, okay, let's just treat this as a substitution cipher and attack. About two thirds of the way through doing that, as it's starting to show me a message, I see a string, main thing to reframe equals mainframe. And I thought back to the first half of the puzzle, which had hints like, you might find yourself feeling a little blue. You need to reframe your approach. You need to think big. When I showed that hint to my wife, she's like, oh, I know exactly what that is. I'm like, I missed that. Feeling blue, thinking big. Big blue means IBM. IBM means the puzzle is freaking EBCDIC. <laughs> so if we go back to that frequency chart, and this is why I made this frequency chart, the blue areas on that chart show where typical ASCII letters are, ASCII characters, from was it 2x to 3f is punctuation with the numbers carved out 30 to 39. Uppercase letters are 4, four and 5s. Lowercase letters are 6 and 7s. This cipher, cipher, like I said, had all high bits just about. And there you go, everything from 8 down. The first block there, the 8s, 9s, and As are lowercase letters. The next block is uppercase letters, a little strip across the bottom of numbers. And that small block over off on the side is punctuation. If I had remembered, enough about EBCDIC from my days on mainframes at school, and if I had had this frequency chart, I would have looked at it and said, oh, there's the answer, and boom, it would have been done. Very subtle, very non-obvious, but the right tool would have shown it to me. Another example of a subtle solution was the UDID data breach. Some of you may remember a few weeks ago, this uh, file that Anonymous posted to Pastebin that they purportedly got from an FBI server filled with a million and one records of iOS uh, data. I started looking at that and people started finding some interesting things. Like Jack Daniel pretty early on said that there are more iPads than iP iPhones, which seemed strange. So I'm looking a little bit more closely and I discovered that there's a whole bunch of duplicate UDIDs, duplicate device IDs, only 985,000 unique ID, uh, devices in there. Some of the devices showed up six, seven, 10, 11 times, which seemed really odd. So I'm wondering, why duplicates? Why so many? So I started looking more closely. I looked at the device that was repeated 11 times. It had the same name every time. It didn't show me anything interesting. The device that was repeated 10 times had different names almost every time. BT, iPad, Wi-Fi, Blue Toad Support, CSR, Customer Service, Developer, Hutchicken. So that's interesting. So I checked the next one that was repeated 10 times. I checked the one that was repeated 8 times, etc. nothing much. Got to a device repeated 7 times, and I found CSR again. Client iPad BT, so now I've connected that back to the first one, both BT and Jessica Slanian. So I looked up Blue Toad online, Jessica Slanian is their marketing head, Hot Chicken is their CIO, so now I've definitely connected these two devices together, and they make applications for iOS. So I sent off an email saying, hey, this is looking odd, didn't hear anything. Spent the rest of that night looking deeper into the file, I ended up finding another uh, 15 to 17 devices, so by the end of, end of that night I had maybe as many as 19 devices that I positively connected back to that company. 
Uh, two of them I'm kind of vague on because they had common names and I only showed, only showed up once. So I sent them another email saying, hey, I, I really think this is you. A few days later they confirmed it, yes, yes it was us. So the trick there again is to look for patterns everywhere. Um, this is a very simple way to solve this. Everybody else, including myself, was trying to get lists of applications from people to look for commonalities across the applications. It's a very technical approach, but turned out a very simple, just looking at the data set uh, approach did it. Uh, a very rich data set and a million records can be fairly rich, especially since you've got human entered text there, can, can really give you some good inferences. Um, visualization tools to look at your data can be really helpful to find those, those subtle patterns like I was showing for Epsidic. Uh, but also simple data manip manipulation tools. Everything that I did to find the UDID, I did just a command line. Because again, I kind of learned Unix on a dumb terminal. Did sort, cut, unique, found things, patterns, counted, stuff like that. Just right there on the command line. Returning to the spec. This is kind of an interesting one. The mistake I make doesn't illustrate the point, but the point is still very valid, so I definitely want to make it. Uh, ThoughtCon this year. They had an interesting puzzle. They had a text adventure. It's basically like a Zork. You would download it, throw it into an interpreter on your PC, even on your iPhone. You could run a Zork interpreter. And you run through this adventure game. You have to do all kinds of things and wander around sort of a fake thought con in the middle of the game. One of the things you do is you find Gmark in his little crypto corner and he gives you a puzzle, which is the same puzzle that you'd find in real life if you visited Gmark in his crypto puzzle, crypto corner. Uh, two or three other tasks you had to accomplish. When you accomplish all of them, it would give you a URL. If you don't then go to fetch that URL in real life, it caused an Atari that they had in the hardware hacking village to display that code on the screen. Now, I wasn't at the con, um, and then nobody got this far during the con, so Sakebon actually sent me a picture of that, and it's not a good picture. It's a little fuzzy. Um, the fuzziness wasn't the only problem with this, however. It's not a normal QR code. It's a mini QR code. It's about a quarter of the size. He's only got one of those little targeting areas, and I couldn't find anything to read this on the phone. I tried about a dozen apps. None of them would read it. Um, it's used a lot of times on, on for example, electronic components because it's so tiny. So if I can't read it, what am I going to do? Well, let's find the spec. Downloaded the specification for QR codes, tried to figure out exactly how it all worked. Identified uh, there's a string of bits there around what would normally be the targeting area. That string is the format code. It's very important to read this format code in the right order. If you start at the top and go down and across, you're reading it backwards, which gives you the wrong data format, the wrong bit mask, the wrong encoding, wrong everything. You can't decode it. Which gives us a special bonus lesson. Listen to your doubts. I had the wrong format string. I knew I had the wrong format string. I didn't care. I kept trying. The format string that I thought I was reading indicated uh, this doesn't really mean too much right now, but an M1 type code versus an M3 type code. M1 type code is very bizarre. They basically take your, your data, split it into base 45 numbers, glom them together in an 11-bit field, and shove it in. It's bizarre. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, because from what I was reading, M1 was typically used for even smaller looking QR codes. But I kept playing with it because other parts of what I saw, the mask setting, seemed reasonable. Uh, with QR codes, they actually specify sort of a bit mask that lay on top of the data, and then they exclusive or those together to get the final code, the point being that you can try uh, four different masks for mini QR codes, I think like eight or ten for a regular QR code. The encoder will try all these different masks until it gets a resultant code that's kind of evenly balanced in black and white. That way you don't have a code that's all white or that's all black. So the mask seemed reasonable, but the code encoding didn't. So then I said, well, maybe I apply the mask to the format string also, which then changes some of the bits in the format string. So it didn't feel right. It felt like I was kind of going into some recursion, but I tried it anyway. And it turned the code back to an M3 code, which made more sense, but it still screwed up the data mask. So it still wasn't working. But I kept trying. I had all these doubts, but I kept trying anyway. Nothing. Then on my way into work next morning, I said, you know, I'm doing that backwards, aren't I? Turns out it was. When you use the, the right approach, you get the right kind of code and the right mask, and boom, now the little black and white dots turn into the right kind of bits you need. You start at the bottom corner, read right to left up, so in the bottom corner there, you might be able to see, uh, looks like 0, 1, but you read right to left. So 1, 0 tells me it's a byte code. Next four bits tell me it's a 9 byte long code. Then you go 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, Going up, you get the H, then the A. When you get to the top, you read a three, three rows up, and then you pop over and start reading down again. Then you get to the bottom, you start reading up again until you get to the blue. 
When you're all done, you get this hacks.by slash z8, which when you uh, uh, go to that website, you then see a um, little message and send this email to people, etc., and that's how you win the, win the contest. Real world example of this is uh, we were looking at a mobile client authenticating with the server and trying to understand just how it's sending data back and forth. Uh, at one point we see a hash and a nonce and a timestamp being sent up for the authentication part. So what kind of hash was it? We had to figure that out. Uh, some of the other information around that hash let us to understand that it was a web services security spec from Oasis, uh, which basically was a SHA hash of the nonce appended to the timestamp appended to the SHA of the password expressed as hex in uppercase. There's where that not remembering to uppercase my hash bit me because I wrote a tool to do all this and I couldn't make a match. And it was a couple hours before I realized, oh yeah, I'm not uppercasing the hash. That's stupid. So anyway, that's how that worked. So the client is providing the nonsense, providing the time segment, it's providing the overall hash in order for the server to then validate that this is a valid hash. It's got to have the missing part, which is the SHA-1 of the password, which means they've got a database of passwords stored in SHA-1 format. And this was just a couple of weeks after the big LinkedIn data breach, which was a huge list of passwords all in SHA-1 format. So we were concerned with this and mentioned it to the customer and recommended that they move to the next version of the spec, where instead of using SHA-1, they used, I think it's a SHA-512, iterated 10,000 times, very long, very slow, much more difficult to try and brute force. As it turns out, the Android app that we were testing at the same time already did that under certain circumstances, and it was on their roadmap to upgrade the iOS soon. So it turns out they were already on top, of it, which was good. So the lesson here was to be prepared to go back to the spec. Be prepared to roll your own code sometimes. You might have to do it in Python, you might have to do it on a spreadsheet, graph paper, whatever it takes. There's still gonna be lots of times when you have to do things manually, very carefully, bit by bit, to understand what it is you're looking at to solve the puzzle or test the app. And if you're gonna do this, read the spec a lot. They're confusing, they're arcane, they use strange language, they, they're, they're never as clear as you hope them to be. And if you're implementing it incorrectly, you're gonna waste time. So should all of this be common sense? That was one comment I've had from people, is that this is all common sense. This is stuff people should always know. That's true. But when you're working on a puzzle, when you're working on a test, when you find something interesting and you're trying to break into something or, or decrypt some data from an application, you get enthusiastic, you get excited, and common sense can just go out the window. Remember that working fast is not the same as working efficiently. And you've got to, so, so all these lessons and other lessons, are, Certainly, this isn't all everything you need to know to test well. Uh, you got to remember all these and plan for breaks. Uh, document everything you do. Go back to the beginning. Evaluate how you're working it. Bottom line is, don't throw away the function that I showed in that, that pseudo code at the beginning. Don't throw away your little evaluation step to see whether or not you're you're making sense as you work. So refresh everything. We had uh, keep it simple. Don't go for the crazy ideas. Sometimes the crazy ideas will be there, but most often not, because people are lazy. Somebody's not going to make the most complicated possible approach to a puzzle or the most complicated approach to a technical problem. Uh, related to that is don't overestimate your target. They're not always going to do it right either. So sometimes you just assume, if you assume they're doing the, the logical thing, even that isn't necessarily a good idea. When you have an idea, make sure that it makes sense logically, physically, technically. Make sure that there's not requirements of related to the idea that just don't work out. Um, try all the things. Circle back to the beginning right now and then. Try the obvious. Don't miss the obvious. Look for things that are obvious. Step back a little bit and say, hey, maybe this is such and such. Um, but also look for subtle things. Use analysis tools, use visualization tools to try and find things that might not be as obvious that are more subtle that might still lead you to a solution by a roundabout path. Be prepared to go back to, to first principles, to go back to a specification and build things yourself. And above all, listen to your doubts. As you gain experience, as you do more of this stuff, as you do test more, those doubts will become more and more important. You may not know where they're coming from, but the fact that you're thinking that tells you that something in your experience, eh, maybe I'm not quite on the right path. It, think about that, try and figure out what it is, you're, you're, why you're doubting it. Maybe your doubt is unfounded and you need to keep on anyway. But you need to at least look at that. The end goal of all this is to go from being a squirrel tester to a discipline tester. And the more discipline you can apply to this, the faster you can get your work done. And maybe, just maybe, if you do all this very well for a long time, 
You can even be an InfoSec rock star. <laughs> so, that's it. Any questions? Oh, yes. Anything stumped you recently? Uh, let's see. <laughs> the uh, Fidelis Security had a puzzle last year at Black Hat that I missed a very obvious simple thing on. And then they had another puzzle this year that had a very similar thing. Uh, last year's they did something where they, they spat out just the, the, the ciphertext is a whole bunch of Unicode characters. Very strange looking crazy things. Um, and when you what you had to do with that was to, to just look at certain nibbles and blend them together and get stuff. So this one was very similar. It was a much larger string of all Unicode. And I kind of looked at that. They, they published it a few weeks before the con. I played with it for a while and didn't get anywhere. They threw out some hints. One hint led you to UTF-16. I said, oh, this is UTF-16. Last year's was UTF-8. OK, so I, I need to play with that. I need to do some stuff. I worked with it for a while, off and on, couldn't get anything. I saw more hints. I couldn't even figure out how to make those hints apply to what I was seeing. I was stuck. On the plane to Vegas to go to DEF CON on that Thursday, so it's the second day of Black Hat, I spent the entire flight on the plane playing with this, just not making any progress. And then literally about 20 minutes before we began our descent, it hit me that, well, maybe I need to convert from UTF-16 to UTF-8. But I didn't have any internet, so I had to figure out how the hell to even do that. Fortunately, Python libraries are pretty well documented internally, so I could go to the libraries on the machine. OK, I need to do this. Tried running that, and it gave me an error. Turns out it wasn't in UTF-16. It was in UTF-8. I had to make it UTF-16. So I had made an assumption early on that was completely wrong. When I made it UTF-16, I then saw the bytes that were in the second hint that they had thrown out two weeks ago, and everything fell into place after that. And then I had to shut the laptop down because we were landing. <laughs> I still wouldn't have been able to make much more progress anyway because it turns out the key was a strange key based on the Fibonacci sequence. Literally, as we're pulling up to the gate and I'm turning on my phone and I'm opening the laptop to scribble down all the numbers so I have them on a piece of paper just in case I'm you know, stuck in baggage claim or something like that. Um, they sent out a tweet showing a little golden spiral and immediately I said, oh, Fibonacci, that's the key. So even if I had known all this stuff two weeks ago, I still would have been completely stumped until I got that tweet. But, but yeah, that was something that stumped me just recently. I was able to win that though. I was very happy. <laughs> I felt really bad about missing it the year before. So, I get stumped on everything. There's every single puzzle. I've always got some step where I'm making a mistake or I'm doing something crazy. And I'm trying very hard to make sure I'm not doing that in, in testing. That's kind of why I did this. And that's why I also try to write up everything that I do. I'm way behind. There's probably six or seven puzzles that I've done that I haven't written up yet on my website. But I try to put them up there so people can learn from my mistakes and also understand how these, how these puzzles and ciphers and stuff work. Um, so it seems like a lot of solving these things is taking lots of information from different places and thinking about like, oh, that hint is this and it's the eighth year or something like that. Um, <laughs> other than your blog where you describe sort of how you solve puzzles and you can get a feel for, okay, these are the kind of tricks that people will, will have in these, do you have any other resources that you recommend people who are getting into these types of things um, to look at? Like, resources to recommend for people to look at for solving these puzzles. A uh, couple things you were saying there. Uh, yes, a lot of times, a lot of these things are dependent upon various and sundry hints that are scattered. And a, a, a tough job is to, to gather them all together. Um, another problem you have at a lot of cons is there'll be multiple contests running at once. So you might get something in your bag that has a string of ciphertext on it. There might be something on, your, on the outside of your badge. There might be something on the inside of your badge. And sometimes they're all related to the same puzzle. Sometimes they're all different puzzles. So you've got to even understand, separate all those before you can, can get down into it. Um, Sometimes they're even on the poster board advertisements at the... They're on the poster board advertisements at the con, which one year ShmooCon stopped me because I didn't even see those. And then yeah. at one time we're all standing outside Reg and Mark is saying something rather to somebody else. And I'm like, yeah, well, no one knows there's code. OK, we need to leave and then we'll come back when nobody's not looking. Um, resources for learning how to do these better. There's not a lot for the for the con, for the for these kind of crypto contests. There's a few. Uh, the 2010-2011 DBIR uh, puzzles were, I think they were both won by the same person, and, and they had good write-ups there. Maybe he won one and came in second the next year. Um, so those have some pretty good write-ups. There's a few others here and there, not, not as many as I wish there were. Because, you know, obviously I think these are important skills to have, and I think you can apply them in lots of places. Also, they're fun. Also, just even that kind of critical thinking, that kind of, of cryptanalysis and stuff, I think is just, it's a skill that, that's interesting and it's fun. I wish more people would. I don't necessarily wish more people would do it, but I would love to see more people play them. Because I think the number of people that even play these at contests are, are vanishingly few. Um, 
there are a lot of good resources that I do use while I'm solving them. Uh, one site, I think it's, I can never remember if it's Rumkin or Runkin. Rumkin.com, I think, is it. And they've got online applets for every cipher you can imagine. Uh, Visionaire, Key Visionaire, Caesar, Playfair, all kinds of ciphers. Um, and that's been very useful. Uh, I do an awful lot, obviously, the command line, base64 encoding, binary changes. I've got all kinds of scripts that I write. And unfortunately, I'm not organized enough to write a good script and make a general purpose. I tend to say, oh, this looks like an exclusive or cipher. Let's see, when did I last use that? I'll copy the script from that last puzzle over here, and I'll start modifying that script, which is a really stupid way to do it, but that's how I seem to, to do it, because I never take the time in between. So building up your own tool chest is, is useful. There's another site that I think would be Google for binary translator. It gives you like uh, six different text fields, and you put something in one of them, and it will translate among them. So you can go from ASCII to hex to binary to base64 to something else. I can't remember what the fifth one was. So little things like that I use all the time. Anything else? What's your website? Darthnull.org. Then you can also look at uh, intrepidusgroup.com. I've got a few things there, but not so much on the puzzle side, more on the, the technical work-related side. So, but my, my regular blog is mostly about the puzzles. All right. Thank you very much. Before you turn so that off, before you turn that off, yes, there's a slide about uh, when I'm, I'm not usually on TV. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't explain it, but that slide was. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to get a shot of you with that in the background. Yeah. <laughs> you have to. Yeah, just stand there. I'll be over here. here. All right. <laughs> oh, sorry. And slip. <laughs> so I'll look like I'm talking. Should look animated. Yeah, look like I just talking. do stuff. Should I pose? <laughs> You can do whatever you want. Should I put all the bird? <laughs> well, that would be normal. It's not so. Thursday, so I don't know. It is no, not it is not Thursday. Good? Not One more. Keep going, please. All right. Oh, God, don't you bring up the other camera? Yeah, of course. Yeah.